Hello, everyone. I'm John Horrigan, and welcome to Journey Through the Past. Thanks for joining me. This program is being brought to you by the Wellesley Council on Aging. Hello to all the members and to all of you watching on Wellesley Public Media. The views and opinions expressed are those of the author and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the Wellesley Council on Aging or Wellesley Public Media. Any content that I provide is of my own personal opinion and is not intended to malign any religion, ethnic group, club, organization, company, individual, or anyone or anything. This program is called Evacuation Day. It's a holiday that people really don't know about. It's only celebrated in Boston and Suffolk County. And it's the story of the British Armada, the British fleet, leaving Boston Harbor on March 17, 1776. Of course, the universal holiday is St. Patrick's Day. I'm John Horrigan. Thanks so much for joining me. So this is about Henry Knox. He had vision, he had the nerve, the gall, to take cannons from Fort Ticonderoga and drag them 300 miles all the way into Dorchester Heights. A Little bit about Henry Knox, um, a hefty fellow, confidant of General George Washington. He served in the Continental Army and then later in the US Army, wrote volumes and volumes on artillery and uh, military maneuvers, very well read. Um, he was also the first Secretary of War. And when he passed at the age of 56 in the year 1806, unfortunately he died, he choked on a chicken bone. Uh, he left behind an entire le legacy and he may have saved Boston and the entire American Revolution for that matter. Henry Knox was a man of principle, a man of honor, determined to shed Boston from the shackles of British colonial rule and he was laughed at when he first proposed to go all the way up to a recently ca captured fort known as Fort Ticonderoga and take the artillery pieces all the way back to Boston. So Henry Knox was born in 1750 in Boston, the seventh of 10 children to William and Mary. And as I mentioned, he had a weight problem throughout his life. He became a bookseller and he was very well read in artillery. He was a member of the Boston Grenadier Corps, 1771. He was also a member of the uh, Society of Cincinnati. And he unfortunately lost two fingers on his left hand during a hunting accident in 1773. And he married Lucy Flucker in 1774. I always have to be careful with that. And his bookstore was actually looted by the British after they were routed in the Battle of Lexington and Concord, April 19, 1775. The British literally ran back to Boston. They commandeered um, as many houses as they could. Loyalists stayed, those who were loyal to the crown. Um, those who were rebels or considered rebels left Boston, and they actually commandeered and uh, destroyed Henry Knox's uh, bookshop. So he fled to Worcester with his uh, wife Lucy, and his brother would join him later. And he participated in the Battle of Bunker Hill in June 1775. So 10 months before this event was the bloody Battle of Bunker Hill, and Knox was lucky to survive that. And of course, he was a good friend of General George Washington, meeting him for the first time in July of 1775 when Washington took command of the Continental Army. So we're talking about uh, taking the high ground, seizing the heights. And George Washington felt, uh, as did Henry Knox, that if they could take the high ground, uh, they lost Bunker Hill or Breed's Hill. But there was another area just uh, south of Boston, an area called Dorchester Heights. And they thought that uh, they saw that the British had no interest whatsoever in taking these heights. If they could somehow mount cannons on top of Dorchester Heights, they could neutralize the loss of Bunker Hill and somehow um, rain artillery shells down onto the British fleet and maybe even force them to leave Boston. If you look at Boston in 1775, 1776, it was known as the Shamit Peninsula. There were basically three main hills on it, and there was only a narrow neck there in the southwest in which to get to Boston. You could get to it by boat, but by land, you had to go through this causeway. And after April 19th, 1775, the British had shut off Boston, and you could only get through with certain orders or certain, certain passes. That's coming out of Boston or into Boston. So when we talk about Boston Neck and the Shama Peninsula, we're talking about Trimont, or now you know it as Tremont, Tremont Street. The three hills were Mount Vernon, Beacon Hill, and Pemberton Hill. 
And there were other two other hills that were surrounding Boston in the North End, one known as Cops Hill and another as Fort Hill. And that's the view uh, when they first came into Boston in 1630. That's what Boston would have looked like with these three hills. Of course, we, we know Beacon Hill. And this is actually the shaving of Beacon Hill uh, taking place in the 1830s and 1840s where they leveled it. And of course, they took the uh, residue, the silt here, and they uh, threw it into the marshes around Boston Harbor, and they would later build on that land. So now I'm going to show you how Boston Harbor was actually filled in with 13 major projects over about a 200-year period. These projects are numbered now. First was West Cove, 1803 to 1863, followed by Mill Pond in 1807 to 1829, and South Cove, 1806 to 1843. East Cove was filled in 1823 to 1874. And then number five is South Boston, 1836 to the present, still expanding. You can see it being built out. South Bay, 1850 until the present time. They're still building that out. That's number six. Number seven is the Back Bay, 1857 to 1894. Number seven, and then Charlestown up here, left-hand corner, 1860 to 1896, that's number eight. And then if you look at area number nine, Fenway, 1878 through 1890. In the right-hand corner, East Boston, number 10, 1880 through the present. Marine Park, number 11 here, 1883 through 1900, including Castle Island. And then 12 was Columbus Park, 1890 through 1901. And finally, Logan Airport still expanding 1922 through the present number 13. So that's how Boston Harbor was filled in. So if you look at Boston proper, originally it was 487 acres. Of course, the prominent features, as I talked about, the three hills, Pemberton, Beacon, and Mount Vernon, but also Copps Hill and Fort Hill. And Trimount is where those three hills were located. So the Boston city limits, you can see the annexations in the landfill that took place from 1804 through 1912. Extraordinary. Satellite view can just show you uh, the build out here in light blue. Purple is the original land formation. One day I hope to walk on the actual Boston neck. I'm looking forward to that. I think I have uh, the geographical coordinates. So you can see the Back Bay added 570 acres of landfill. And of course you can see old Boston versus today and where Copley Square resides, which was actually in the harbor at one time, as well as the public garden. And again, that's what Boston would have looked like uh, to Native Americans prior uh, to the encroach encroachment by Puritans. And again, just looking at the dark section is the original formation of land prior to the settlers. And you can see Noddles Island, which was important in early battles of the American Revolution, was eventually uh, appropriated and built out. And also Bird Island, Governor's Island, Apple Island were taken as well. This is 1630. So after the British took over Boston in April of 1775, um, they, they were essentially surrounded. If you can see all the forts here, the gun batteries and redoubts that were built by the colonists, as opposed to the lighter colored British positions in Boston. Yes, they had seized Boston, but they essentially had caged themselves in with uh, their only lifeline back to Britain was by ship. So Henry Knox uh, in that uh, following fall and into early 1776, made a proposal to George Washington about taking the cannon from Fort Ticonderoga and bringing it all the way into Boston. And you can see the map that we'll be talking about in the right-hand corner, Fort Ticonderoga, all the way down the Hudson and Mohawk Rivers, across the Berkshires, through Springfield, into Cambridge. There's Boston, British occupied. Here's Charlestown, Bunker Hill, and Breeds Hill, also British occupied after the Battle of Bunker Hill. So the British, even though they blockaded Boston, there was a quarantine they were actually trapped in the port of Boston in the fall of 1775. But the colonists lacked all siege guns and storm troops. They weren't that well trained. Again, Washington had only assumed command after Bunker Hill in July of 1775 and tried to make them into an army. But they felt if they could get artillery, they could threaten British shipping from only two places, Bunker Hill, which was lost, and now Dorchester Heights, which was being left unguarded by the British. Of course, Knox volunteered his expertise to General Artemis Ward, uh, and he was commissioned as a colonel by George Washington. And he suggested to General Washington that Cannon, and you'll see me refer to Washington as His Excellency, but he suggested, what if we took that cannon and repositioned it 
uh, from Fort Ticonderoga on Dorchester Heights. Now, Fort Ticonderoga um, was a fort uh, built originally by the colonists. They lost it to the British. And then uh, Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys, along with Benedict Arnold, who never got credit uh, for this, took it back in the middle of the night. In fact, that was one of the reasons why uh, Benedict Arnold um, might have been a turncoat, because uh, he wasn't appreciated after uh, his efforts uh, during the seizure of Fort Ticonderoga. But they proposed to take it by boat, by sled or sledge, by wagon. And of course, when Knox first proposed this idea, it was scoffed at by all ranking officers except for George Washington, who endorsed his proposal. And he said, quote, no trouble or expense must be spared to obtain these guns. So, but this was an operation built on assumptions. It was going to be performed in, in the middle of harsh New England winters, and we'll look at those later. Um, and they had a bunch of assumptions. They need ice in places, unfrozen rivers and lakes and other places. After uh, George Washington authorized this operation by Henry Knox, he began to put it together. And again, uh, because they lacked communications aside from a horse and rider, he had to, to make a, a lot of assumptions and decisions that he hoped would break in his favor. One of the great things of being a historian or a historist or a folklorist or a folklorian, whatever I am, is I got to go into the Mass Historical Society archives and actually look at the Henry Knox diaries on microfilm. And still to this day, you know, it brings me tingles to think that I could look back uh, into an event that took place uh, hundreds of years ago. So we're going to look at the plan in uh, what in, in the actual Knox diaries here, and I'm going to quote him. So it's November for the Knox expedition, and Henry's plan was, quote, move from Fort Ticonderoga down Lake George, down the west bank of the Hudson as far as Albany, then cross the river and down the east bank as far as Kinderhook, from whence to turn due east across the Berkshires, through Great Barrington, Monterey, Otis, Blandford, Westfield, Springfield, and so to Cambridge. The step off at Cambridge was on horseback with his brother William on November 16th. This is the amazing part. The maturity that Henry Knox shows, he's only 25 years old. And of course, uh, uh, his deputy is his brother, uh, William, who's only 19 years old at the time. But they went on a special mission um, to New York City, probably sent with orders from Washington uh, on November 16th. And uh, they were looking for reinforcements for Boston before they headed to Albany, New York. So again, Henry Knox and his brother, William, uh, they desired unfrozen lakes in some, some spots, frozen rivers in some spots. They wanted to cross the Mohawk and the Hudson. And they also needed snowpack to drag the sleds or sledges by oxen. And I've taken an account of weather um, that took place in the area. Uh, I, you could actually find out the weather of almost every single day since the Pilgrims landed in Plymouth uh, in Boston. Somebody wrote it down in their journal uh, in some publication at some point. That's all they had. They'd, take, they'd measure wind, uh, wind speeds, uh, barometric readings, um, and actually sky conditions. But we know that it was clear from November 16th through the 20th in Dedham, Massachusetts, with a moderate snowfall on November 21st. So here's the intended route. First, they had to get to Ticonderoga, secure supplies, secure oxen, secure uh, men to pull it. Uh, it was an impossible operation on paper, but he did pull it off. They left from Fort Ticonderoga, uh, went down Lake George, headed south to Albany, Claverack, into Springfield, through Framingham, and into Dorchester Heights. And you can see the map on the left-hand side. I'm going to be referring to it. You can see the inset of Boston, the insert there on the right. But uh, basically, they start from Fort Ticonderoga, head south, and then at some point cross the Hudson, which is an, a large river, and then uh, cross the Berkshires, very treacherous with icy conditions, and then move it across into Eastern Mass. That's what Fort Ticonderoga looks like today. Of course, it's a tourist attraction. It's a massive star-shaped facility, and that gave them, uh, they had the high ground uh, so they could fire down uh, on any invaders that were coming either up Lake George or even at the foot of Lake Champlain. And again, another photograph. Um, I highly recommend, if you can, taking a trip up there to look at Fort Ticonderoga. Another photograph of Fort Ticonderoga on the shores of Lake Champlain. 
So this is a depiction of Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold seizing Fort Ticonderoga from the British that May of 1775. This operation kicked off six months later, but there wasn't much resistance. I believe that there were a couple of uh, British troops that were wounded, but essentially this is Ethan Allen with his sword saying, we have come to claim this fort, and the gentleman comes out in his night clothes. Yes, right, right away, here are the keys. Uh, may we leave? <laughs> Here's a commemorative stamp. And that's what uh, painting, this uh, oil painting of what Fort Ticonderoga would look like in the wintertime. So in order to take these cannon from Fort Ticonderoga, they would use winches, police, uh, to, to lift them up. You're talking about really heavy ordnance here. And as I mentioned, 60 tons worth. You'll see 58, 59, or 60 cannons. We don't know the exact count. I trust Knox, although I've heard the term 60. And McCullough says 58, David McCullough, the great historian. So, December now, they arrive at Fort Ticonderoga. Um, what's going to happen is Henry Knox is going to get out in front of this cannon train, which will stretch to be over a mile long at points. And his job is his brother will be hauling all the equipment from Fort Ty, um, across Lake George, down the banks of the Hudson. Meanwhile, Henry's out a day ahead of them trying to secure bivouac, sleeping areas, uh, provisions, food, um, and more oxen and uh, more men. So he arrives in Albany, Henry does, via the Hudson River on December 1st, and he reports to General Philip Schuyler, and right there he procures sled, rope, oxen, men, boats, and provisions for his operation. Now Schuyler was ordered by General Washington to assist the Knox brothers with all the facets of the operation, get the expedition to and from Fort Ticonderoga, and help transport the heavy ordnance across the Berkshire Mountains and also the Alleghenies. The expeditionary force re reached Fort George on the 3rd of December by riding on frozen, rutted roads to the southern end of Lake George. And on the 5th, the rafts and boats landed at Fort Ticonderoga after traveling 33 miles north on Lake George and then to the southern tip of Lake Champlain and Fort Ticonderoga. The number of men in Knox's expeditionary force varied from several dozen to nearly 150 by the time they reached Albany, and it was contingent upon the location of the cannon train. The exact numbers are unknown due to Knox's limited diary entries, but a rough guess is about maybe 43 to 45 yoke of oxen, a pair, and maybe 80 to 85 men. We just don't know the exact count. Uh, Henry Knox, who was a prolific writer during and after the American Revolutionary War, really kept it close to the vest with this operation. Should his men be captured, should he be captured, and his diaries. So here's Fort Ticonderoga, and you can see NY1 and NY2. There are dozens of historical markers that you could follow and take uh, from Fort Ticonderoga all the way into Dorchester if you wanted. So they're at Fort Ticonderoga, and December 5th through the 8th, there's portage to Lake George from Lake Champlain. In other words, they take the uh, cannon from Fort Ticonderoga, upper left-hand corner, and then they have to haul it across land, put it into boats, and row it over 30 miles down Lake George, then remove it and put it on sleds and drag it. So when they arrive at Fort Ticonderoga, of course, it's under colonial control. And you can see some of the cam cannons there today. There is one authentic cam cannon that still remains at Fort Ticonderoga. There are three types of artillery pieces, left to right, the cannon, the longer range one, the howitzer, medium range, and mortar, short range. So a mortar, short range, is an indirect fire weapon that fires explosive projectiles known as mortar bombs at low velocities, short ranges, and high arcing ballistic trajectories. And it's typically muzzle loading and has a barrel length less than 15 times its caliber. In other words, they put the powder and the projectile inside the mouth of the mortar. The howitzer is a type of artillery piece characterized by a relatively short barrel and the use of comparatively small propellant charges to propel projectiles at relatively high trajectories with a steep angle of descent. Of course, the cannon is any piece of artillery that uses gunpowder or other usually explosive-based propellants to launch a projectile. Now, cannon vary in caliber, the size, range, mobility, the rate of fire, the angle of fire, and firepower. And different forms of cannon combine and balance these attributes in varying degrees. Now, 78 pieces were salvageable, ranging from a four pound to a 24 pound cannon. Now we think that there was one or two 
two 24 pounders. We know there was one 24 pounder and also an 18 pounder. And the reason these are long range and they could seriously inflict damage on British ships uh, if they were to fire. Now, again, the British had cannons on their ships and they could return fire. But all, they also seized guns, mortars, howitzers, flints to ignite the gunpowder, and tons of muskets and cannonballs. So they nicknamed uh, these two big cannons. The 24-pounder was called Independence. The Liberty was the 18-pounder. On December 6, at Fort Placed Arms Dock at Fort Ticonderoga near King's Store, Knox's men loaded 42 sleds with 16 brass and 26 iron cannon eight brass mortars, six iron cohorns, six iron howitzers, 2,300 pounds of lead, and a barrel of flints. Uh, the historian David McCullough says 58. I've seen 55, 56. We just don't know. But they loaded them into three types of boats to now take them down Lake George, a scow, a bateau, and a petty auger. It took three days to move the cannon, 60 tons, from the fort to the north shore of Lake George. Again, they had to haul it over land. And on December 9th, they loaded up the boats and shoved off heading south on Lake George. Again, Henry left his brother William, who was only 19, in charge of the heavy elements, and then Henry rode ahead uh, to station the necessary engineering tasks. He had to procure ho horses, uh, procure oxen and sleds, secure billets where they'd sleep, provisions, and finalize travel routes. So they took it from Fort Ty Ticonderoga, and that's the actual first placard, the first monument there. And there's one uh, all along the route, Route 9. There's one in Framingham. There's one in Watertown, Dorchester. It's so here's from Knox's diary, December 6th, the loading at Fort Ticonderoga. The weather here, I'm making assumptions based on the weather in Dedham that I found and the, the, when he describes it. But we know it's cold. It's above freezing. The uh, Lake George is not frozen at this time. But Long Knox's diary entry for December 6, 1775 reads, employed in getting the cannon from the fort on board a gundalo, that's a boat, in order to get them to the bridge. Once loaded, the gundalo was sailed or rowed around the peninsula of Ticonderoga and into the river La Chute, and then about a half mile up to the bridge that carried the portage road across the river just below the falls. This was the head of navigation from Lake Champlain, and here the cannon were unloaded off the gundalo while it returned for another load. So they had to actually transport it from um, the Fort Ticonderoga, use boats, then take it, known as portage, across land and reload the boats. Here's the second marker loading at Ticonderoga, and you can see the little howitzers there on the marker. So it's December 7th and December 8th. They're debarking at Fort Ticonderoga. Knox's diary for December 7th, 1775 reads, employed in getting the cannon from the bridge to the landing at Lake George. We know the weather was cold above freezing. At this very moment, though, Benedict Arnold is, is uh, on trekking towards Quebec, his ill-fated mission um, where his army, half of them deserted uh, and, or froze to death. They had to actually eat their shoes, eat their accompanying dogs. It was a disaster. And right as Benedict Arnold arrived in Quebec, a mammoth blizzard hit. And that did impact the weather of the Knox expedition. We know that it snowed in Dedham as well. So while Knox was supervising the overland movement of the cannon down the Portage Road to the Lake George Landing, the gundalo was employed moving the 16 smaller pieces from Fort Ticonderoga to the bridge where they would be ready the next day. And the diary entry uh, for December 8th corroborates that. It says, ditto the mortars. It took a second day to take the mortars down. So December 9th, shove off. We're way up here, left-hand corner, Fort Ticonderoga, red circle. Here's what his diary says, December 9th. Employed in loading the scow, petty auger, and a bateau. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, set sail to go down the lake in the petty auger. The scow coming after us run aground. They have some issues here because they're, they're laden with heavy artillery. We being about a mile ahead with a fair wind to go down, but unfair to help the scow. So the scow is left behind. That's another thing with this expedition, the cannon train, they'd stop if there was an issue with, with uh, some of the people uh, in the long line, they'd stop and waited till they caught up. But the wind was dying away. We, with the utmost difficulty, reached Sabbath day point about nine o'clock in the evening, went ashore and warmed ourselves by an exceeding good fire in a hut made by some civil Indians who were with their ladies abed. They gave us some venison, roasted after their manner, which was very relishing. So they meet some Native Americans and they share a meal with them. Dear. Continued December 9th. The scow had run on a sunken rock, but not in such a manner as to be irretrievable that they had broken all the ropes, which they had in endeavoring to move her off, but was ineffectual that they had sent up to the fort for more ropes, they needed more ropes, and hands, and intended in the morning to make another trial. 
The crew of the bateau, after having refreshed themselves, told me, as they were not very deeply loaded, that they intended to push for Fort George at the south end of the lake, and at this point, the cannon train was halfway down the lake at a place called Sabbath Day Point. We know, according to the Canadian weather accounts of Caleb Haskell uh, and Thomas Ansley and Captain Henry Dearborn and General Montgomery, British and colonial leaders here, uh, we know about the weather. So there's a hazard in Lake George on December 7th through December 8th. Right off the bat, they encounter a glitch. Again, here's the salvage operation of that boat that stuck December 9th. Uh, and this is uh, according to William's diary now, his brother. He says, accordingly, I jumped into the boat and ordered my man to bring my baggage, and we would go We would go with them accordingly. We set out it being 11 o'clock with a slight breeze ahead. The men rode briskly, but we had not been out about above an hour when the wind sprang up very fresh and directly against us. So now they're rowing into the wind. The men, after rowing exceedingly hard for about four hours, seemed desirous of going ashore to make a fire to warm themselves, and I knowing them to be very exceedingly wary. So... They're rowing these boats into a savage wind uh, coming uh, from the south of Lake George. Very cold night. December 10th, again, William's Diary. They're at Bolton Landing, and we know the wind is still cold wind blowing from the south. Quote, we warmed ourselves sufficiently and took a comfortable nap, laying with our backs to the fire. The next morning, they started again about half an hour before daybreak. That is about a quarter after rising, we set out, and in six hours and a quarter of excessive hard pushing against a fresh breeze, we reached Fort George. So it took them six and uh, hours and 15 minutes before they got to Fort George at the southern end of the lake. This is Bolton Landing, by the way. It's marker number six, and you can find these on the internet. Again, Bolton Landing. And these plaques, as I mentioned, are all along the route. They generally read the same thing. This is Henry's landfall at Fort George Village on the 11th of December. He arrived just after noon, and mild weather made the lake trip easier, but now snow and cold temperatures were preferred before the cannon train, which was still on the lake, began the land carriage phase of the operation. So before they began the phase of dragging them, they needed snow because they had sleds. They committed. Also, there must be solid ice in the Hudson in order to cross the Hudson River and thick enough to take the 1,800 pounds weight of its largest gun. The 24-pounder actually weighed 1,800 pounds, almost a ton. Weather is cold and above freezing. And in Henry's diary, on Monday the 11th, I sent an express to Squire Palmer of Stillwater, that's uh, one of the leaders in Stillwater, New York, to prepare a number of sleds and oxen to drag the cannon to be ready by the first snow. So here's the base of Lake George at Fort George. Henry, again, is out in front of the expedition. And there's the marker at Fort George Village. Henry had been there by December 9th at uh, Sabbath Day Point. William didn't reach that with a cannon train until December 13th. So we know that December 11th, Henry reached Fort St. George. Uh, by December 16th, five days later, uh, they're lagging. The boats reached there. And finally, by December 30th, they had the sled teams in place. So there was long delays, but that gave Henry additional time. This is from Henry's uh, December 12th diary entry, a plea for Palmer's provisions. And he seems, sends a letter here. Fort George, December 12th, 1775. Captain Palmer, sir, I must beg that you would purchase or get made immediately 40 good strong sleds that will each be able to carry a long cannon clear from dragon in the ground, which will weigh 5,400 pounds each and likewise, that you would procure oxen or horses as you shall judge most proper to drag them. I think that you may be able to purchase sleds that are already made, by uh, which by strengthening might do. The sleds that they are first put upon are to go to the camp near Boston, the cattle as far as Albany or Kinderhook, where we must get fresh ones, Henry Knox. So he explains it. I need horses, oxen. I need sleds that can uh, uh, have a lot of durability, can carry these heavy weights. It's a cold day. Now, meanwhile, back on the lake, and now the winds are blowing from the northwest, cold. They're going to get that ice that they wanted. Uh, on the 13th, being very uneasy at not hearing of our little fleet, we dispatched an express boat about two o'clock. But in the afternoon, we received advice that on the morning of the 10th, the scow had gotten off the rock. They finally removed it on which she had run and with great difficulty had reached Sabbath day point. And on the same night, the wind being exceedingly high, the sea had beaten her such in such a manner that she sunk. So in other words, Henry's waiting. Where, where's the cannon train? He sends a boat and they find out they're at Sabbath Bay. They get the scow off the rocks, um, but they have to lose the the ship, they get the artillery off the, the boat because it sank. So December 13th, Sabbath day point. December 16th, finally the cannon arrives at the base 
of Fort St. George. Diary, Fort George, December 16, 1775. Received of Henry Knox $26, which Captain John Johnson paid to different quarters for the use of their cattle in dragging cannon from the fort of Fort Ticonderoga to the north of Lake George. William Brown, junior lieutenant. So they agreed to participate in this operation. Lake George is beginning to freeze. And again, at some point, um, they're going to exchange and get their cattle back uh, per Knox's terms once they meet up with the men from Massachusetts. So now Knox writes on December 16th to General Schuyler in Albany. Sir, we have been so fortunate as to get the mortars and cannons safely over the lake to this place. I arranged with Captain Palmer of Stillwater to get proper conveyances for them from here. We are apprehensive of a difficulty at Albany. He doesn't use punctuation, kind of like the way I text. We are apprehensive of a difficulty at Albany for want of a proper scow. They lost that. I'm not well enough acquainted with the road after we cross at the half moon to know whether it be practicable to keep on the east side of the river entirely to Kinderhook. I expect Captain Palmer up with the teams on Tuesday or Wednesday, and I expect to move as far as Saratoga if the sledding continues as at present. From thence, we must wait for snow. And I wrote to Mr. Livingston at Albany for 500 fathom, fathoms of three-inch rope to fasten the, the cannon to the sleds. It has not yet arrived. A lot going on here. Needs another boat. Um, he, he doesn't even know which way he's going. Which, which side of the river should we travel on? He doesn't know the territory. And um, he's asking for more rope in which to secure the cannons and the howitzers and the mortar to the sled so they don't tip over. So it's Christmas Eve now, and he makes a departure to Saratoga. Now they're getting into the teeth of the winter. The snow begins to fall. Glens Falls. And this is an update that Knox sends on December 17, 1775 to General Washington. Fort George, December 17, 1775 to General Washington. I have made 42 exceedingly strong sleds and have provided 80 yoke of oxen to drag them as far as Springfield, where I shall get fresh cattle to carry them to camp. The route will be from here to Kinderhook, from whence into Great Barrington, Massachusetts Bay, and down to Springfield. There will scarcely be any possibility of carrying them from here to Albany or Kinderhook, but on sleds, the roads being very gullied. Again, remember, with the roads, they didn't have asphalt. And when the rains came and, and wagons traversed them, they'd create these hard gullies, which could destroy wagon wheels. At present, the sledding is tolerable to Saratoga, about 26 miles. So he's saying, I've got snow on the ground. I think I can do this and drag them. We know it's very, very cold. And again, Lake George is freezing. Again, you can see some entries here from the actual letter that Knox wrote on December 17, 1775. He's writing to Washington. Again, he says, Beyond there is none. I have sent for sleds and teams to come here and expect to begin to move them to Saratoga on Wednesday or Thursday next, uh, trusting that between this and then we shall have a fine fall of snow, which will enable us to proceed further and make the carriage easy. If that should be the case, I hope in 16 or 17 days to be able to present your excellency with a noble train of artillery, the inventory of which I have enclosed. So now he's making assumptions. Hey, as long as I get snow, I, I can do this in less than three weeks. Little did Knox know it would take double that time. So it's December 24th, Christmas Eve. We know that it's uh, snowing furiously in Dedham, Mass. They get two feet of snow and also in uh, Saratoga region. So Knox goes by foot to Fort Miller and then crosses the Hudson. Diary where Judge Dewar procured me a sleigh to go to Stillwater. So he gets a sleigh. He doesn't have to walk at this point. Uh, a local judge provides him with transportation. He then crosses the Hudson by ferry to the west side and arrives at Saratoga in a place called Schuylerville, where he stops and has dinner. Diary. We dined and set off about three o'clock. It's, snow it's still snowing exceeding fast. And after the utmost efforts of the horses, we reached Ensign's Tavern, eight miles beyond Saratoga, and we lodged. Henry, not William. They're following further behind them. So that's where he is, the blue circle there, Saratoga. So you'll see some images, but you can imagine what this train, what a spectacle it would be to those who saw it, heard it, and even smelled it. A long, mile-long train of oxen being tended to uh, by men dragging these cannons. So now they're leaving for Stillwater, again, December 24th, 1775. And some of these had to be actually dragged by horses. And you can see they take the wheels off and put them on sledges. And again, uh, this is a, a, an arduous pull. Knox awoke. He found two feet of fresh snow on the ground. He was delighted. He goes to Stillwater and gets another sleigh to go on to Albany. He gets the snow that he had hoped for. 
Diary. The roads not being broken prevented our getting farther than New City, which is modern day Lansingburg, about nine miles above Albany where we lodged. So note, the road to Albany at that time would have had them cross the Hudson to the east side at Lansing's Ferry at Half Moon, pass through Lansingburg to what is now Troy, New York, and then pass back to the west side of the Hudson at Schuyler Flats to reach Albany. Now, the Charles River is a trickle at its widest point when you compare it to the mighty Hudson River. So we had to cross the river uh, from, from, the east, uh, from the west to the east and then cross back to reach Albany. All the while, and that's where we're talking about the Half Moon area, New City. Okay, so they come down on the east side, cross over to the west side, and then head south to Albany, which is on the west side of the Hudson River. Treacherous. So December 26th, Boxing Day, arrival in Albany. This is uh, Henry Knox's diary. In the morning, we set out and only got about two miles when our horses tired and refused to go any farther. I was then obliged to undertake a fatiguing march of about four miles in snow, three feet deep through the woods, there being no beaten path. Imagine that heavy set man, over 300 pounds, uh, up to his waist almost. He had to walk four miles. I got to Squire Fisher's, who politely gave me a fine breakfast and provided me with horses, which crossed me as far as Colonel Schuyler's, where I got a sleigh to carry me to Albany, where I reached about two. I had almost perished with the cold. He almost froze to death. Again, now it's bitter cold. The wind is blowing from the northwest. And meanwhile, uh, Arnold uh, is trying to scale the walls, which he can't in Quebec. Again, there's a depiction of what the cannon train would have looked like as they dragged it through snow. Quite a spectacle. So the arrival in all Albany on December 26th. And then from December 27th through the 29th, he begins to, begins to procure resources, Henry does, in Albany. Diary, he writes, General Schuyler sent out his wagon master and other people to all parts of the country to immediately send up their sleighs with horses suitable, allowing them 12 shillings per day for each pair of horses and oxen per ton for 62 miles. So a lot of people are buying into this project. Uh, we know now with the weather in Dedham, for instance, there's deep snow. It's, it's really, really cold. But in New York, rather, now, the snow, it's just slightly above freezing. The sun has come out, and that beating sun has began to thaw and melt the ice in the snow. So finally, December 30th, end of December, the sled teams arrive at Fort George. It took them that long, uh, nearly a month, to get down Fort George 33 miles, and now they're offloading that onto sleds. sleds. So sleds and team finally arrive at Fort George, Lake George, and they're loaded as they arrive and then sent southward towards Albany. Meanwhile, Henry, jo uh, Henry Knox has procured all the sleighs and the men uh, and the beasts of burden that would be necessary to haul this artillery. But the lack of continuing cold had prevented the river from freezing, freezing deeply enough to allow the sleds to cross on the ice when they reached Lansing's Ferry, New City. So we know now the snow is beginning to melt, as is the ice. We know it's raining in Dedham. Uh, Nathaniel Ames in one of his diaries says on December 31st they had rain. So it's not cold enough to sustain the snow. So finally, January 2nd to January 3rd, 1776, William with the sled train, the sled teams are departing from the base uh, of uh, Lake George. And as the guns moved slowly down the road from Lake George, Knox waited in Albany for colder weather, and he even had his men try to thicken the ice by drilling holes and pouring buckets of river water over the surface to freeze. Uh, an old Zamboni trick almost of the noble train of artillery. January 4th, the lead sleds had reached Albany, so they made good ground. Once they got off of Lake George, they made tremendous progress uh, to get to Albany. Then the 24-pound prize of the drag, which was the independence. The lead cannon train reaches Albany on January 4th, and the first of the guns cross the Hudson at Lansing's Ferry, and they arrive in Albany in Diary. Uh, Thursday the 4th arrived a brass 24-pounder and a small mortar. And note, they never went to Braintree, as depicted in the wonderful John Adams series. Anyways, we know in Dedham it's warm and hard rain, so now they're encountering, uh, encountering a thaw. So a letter to Washington, this is January 5th, an update to His Excellency. The want of snow detained us for some days, and now a cruel thaw hinders from crossing the Hudson River, which we're obliged to do four times from Lake George to this town. The first severe night will make the ice sufficiently strong. Till that happens, the cannon and the mortars must remain where they are. These inevitable delays pain me exceedingly, but we got over four more, 18 pounders. 
So Knox hoped that once the thickening ice permits the rest of the guns to get into Albany, there'll be enough snow on the roads to get them easily to Springfield, and he predicts arrival there in the eight or nine days after the first severe freeze. Why not? They made tremendous pro progress once they got off Lake George. So now January 6th, there's loss of a heavy cannon at Half Moon Ferry. The ice isn't thick enough. Diary. In the afternoon, much alarmed by hearing that one of the heaviest cannon had fallen into the river at Half Moon Ferry. The ice is too thin, so he issues orders to send the remainder of the sleds to a safer crossing, crossing, a safer portage. Diary. At Slosses, as the ice was so much stronger there than at Half Moon, the usual place of crossing. They found another uh, way to ford the river. And this new crossing is on the Mohawk, west of the Hudson River, later known as Klossus Ferry, near Crescent. So here's what we're talking about. They're east of the river, they cross over at Slosses, across the Mohawk, then travel down the western bank of the river into Albany. And of course, they're having trouble at Half Moon. And then a second cannon goes into the rink. This is January 7th, 1776. Another cannon slips into the river as Knox attempts to move the cannon train eastward over the Hudson to Rensselaer. Diary. The cannon, which the night before last came over at Slosses Ferry, we attempted to get over the ferry here, which we effected except in the last, which fell into the river, notwithstanding the precautions we took. Now, the remainder of the cannon train reaches Albany on January 8th. In the diary, he says, We went on the ice about 8 o'clock in the morning and proceeded so carefully that before night, we got over 23 sleds, that's half the expedition, and we're so lucky as to get the cannon out of the river, owing to the assistance the good people of the city of Albany gave. Now, imagine this, that all of the residents, the men, the women, and the children came out from, from the little village of Albany, New York, to help Knox's men pull the cannon out of the river. Here, here, Albany, New York, you saved the revolution. So, again, I always like to toast the helpful folk of Albany. So again, so the expedition now, they've crossed the river uh, and they're in Albany. There'll be one more crossing. And this is uh, uh, from John Becker. He's 12 years old. He's from old Saratoga, New York. And he served with his father as a driver for Knox on the trip from Fort George to Springfield, Mass. And he left account of his trip, which was first published in the Albany Gazette in the 1830s. Quote, he's only 12 years old. We felt an unusual degree of interest in fulfilling our contracts, Beck, Becker remembered. My father took in charge a heavy iron nine-pounder, which required the efforts of four horses to drag it alone. Others had the heavy resistance of 18s and 24-pounders to overcome, which required the exertions of at least eight horses. Think about that now. So he needed four horses to drag a nine-pounder, eight horses to drag an 18-pounder, and probably an additional four or 12 horses to drag the 24-pounders. So we had altogether about 40 or 50 pieces to transport, and our cavalcade was quite imposing. So at Lansing's Ferry, near the mouth of the Mohawk River, the cavalcade tried to cross in the ice to the east bank of the Hudson River. As a precaution, a 40-foot rope was tied to the first sleigh tongue, and a teamster walked alongside with a hatchet, ready to cut the rope and save the horses should the heavy gun crash through the ice. And that's what happened. Halfway across, according to the diary, the ice did give way, quote, and the noble 18 sank with a crackling noise and then a heavy plunge to the bottom of the stream. The water fortunately was shallow and the gun was eventually recovered, but the crossing at this point therefore was abandoned. Now, again, this is Becker again. Backtracking, the train finally crossed the Mohawk at Klaus's Ferry on thin ice, remaining on the west side of the Hudson River until they got to Albany. One cannon was lost on the Mohawk River and left there. Within three days, the remainder of the guns had entered Albany for the final cross crossing of the Hudson River. Quote, our appearance excited the attention of the burghers. This was the first artillery which Congress had been able to call their own, and it led to reflections not in the least inferior to our cause. And again, this is how they'd have to cross it, actually get across the Hudson River through broken ice and, of course, make their beasts of burden move for them. January 9th, Knox is now heading for Claverack. And having seen his train of sleds safely on their way eastward from Albany, Knox rides on ahead. Diary. I set out from thence. Of course, he, they, that's where they came together, where his brother brought the expedition train to Henry Knox and in his small quorum of men. And now he's going out in advance to find, again, provisions, a route, uh, um, horses, men. I set out from thence about 12 o'clock and went as far as Claverack, about nine miles beyond Kinderhook. But a broken sleigh detained him for two days. He broke a rail. So Knox had a policy of delaying the entire column if but one of its components got into trouble. One for all. 
So now Kinderhook depicted there the blue circle. So early historians determined that the route through Claverack was due south on the post road, which is Route 9H, to the present village of Claverack, and then east on Route 23 into Massachusetts. That is the route marked by the Knox Trail monuments erected in 1927, but research done in the early 1970s suggested a more southeasterly route from Kinderhook towards the Massachusetts border above North Egremont and then on to Great Barrington. So in other words, here's where they thought they crossed into Massachusetts, but I'll just show you a diversion. There's the, right there, that maybe they may have taken a southeasterly direction in bypass Claverack altogether, we don't know. So there might have been dips in the trail, uh, and also they may have tried to evade local enclaves, loyalists. If loyalists ever saw this uh, expedition, this mile-long uh, cannon train, they may have, might have sent out British troops, so they had to keep it secret from the loyalists, and somehow they did the entire expedition. But you can see here, this is a travel route that they believe took place. In other words, they went from Kinderhook directly to Claverhack in a southeasterly direction. So at Claverhack, and this is January 11th, they finally reached Massachusetts. Knox took the hazardous military trail used only by a few others, which headed east over the Berkshires through Great Barrington, Otis, and onto Springfield on what is now modern day 23, which is a treacherous road for motorists even today. At that point, we know he had 86 oxen in place of horses or 43 yokes, 43 pair. So again, now they get into Great Barrington, time to cross the Berkshires. January 11th, Massachusetts, diary. We reached number one, he's referring to Monterey, Massachusetts, after having climbed mountains from which we might almost have seen all the kingdoms of the earth. Now, this is the end of the known Henry Knox diary entries. For all intent and purpose, he goes dark at this point, makes no more entries. But to him, half the battle was over. They had taken uh, all of the artillery uh, from Fort Ticonderoga, down Lake George, down the Hudson, crossing the Hudson and Mohawk Rivers at several points, and now they're into Massachusetts. He can see Oz. Now, imagine that. This gives you an idea of going over the hills and terrain uh, these are actually the foothills of the Berkshire, trying to get the men up there in in almost knee deep snow, two to two feet deep, and drag them up these hills down the next. And of course, with the refreezing, there were icing icy conditions. So the expedition now moves east. Their goal is Boston, almost there. They're moving east to Otis. Now that's me along the marker along Route 23 in Otis. Um, 20 pounds ago, and on a hot summer day. Now, treacherous green woods. This is the most difficult part of the entire operation. It's a 12-mile stretch known as green woods, and it was made dreary and forbidding by dense evergreen forests, uh, slippery rocks, icy conditions. They literally had to carve their own way through the mountains in order to drag these sleds and these horses and uh, these wagons. Uh, to get them up and down the mountain. And uh, they passed through what's now East Otis, and then they reached a place called Blanford, and that's where more trouble awaited him. They had to make a descent of Glasgow Mountain in Westfield. And this was Henry Knox's finest hour, in my opinion. When men give up or refuse orders due to their own personal safety or a lack of faith in the operation, a lack of inspiration, that is when a leader must emerge. You can see this probably doesn't even capture how treacherous, how treacherous the footing was. Um, it's one thing trying to haul it up a mountainside. It's another trying to bring it down safely. It's a cold day in January in 1776, the 12th, and they're on the side of a mountain in the Berkshires. The entire American Revolution may have hung in a band's teetering on the brink of failure. If he didn't bring these cannons to Boston, maybe the British would still be there. This artillery was required to end the siege of Boston by an oppressing occupier who looted and burned homes, assaulted colonial men, insulted their wives, and were indignant to their children. An army bankrolled by an imperialist king who sought to unfairly tax and brutally suppress a self-sustaining population 3,000 miles away. And again, now they're trying to bring all of the equipment over the hills of the Berkshires. It required, they say, three hours of coaxing by Henry Knox to assure the Hudson Valley Teamsters that the treacherous trip downhill could be made without danger from runaway weighted sleds that would plummet downhill upon them. So Knox supervised the precautionary measures, such as drag chains, 
poles that were thrust under the runners and check ropes, which were anchored to one tree after another. Now, this block and tackle idea of weights and pulleys and ropes came from Knox consulting with the Marbleheaders, John Glover, the previous autumn. Now, Glover was the one who helped uh, Washington cross the Delaware. I'm wondering what Knox said. Maybe he said something to this effect. These are my words, but maybe during this three-hour plea to the men who are about to go back home to New York and abandon the expedition at the peak of one of the mountains in the Berkshires. Maybe he said something to this effect. And maybe after he said it, they said, we're with you, Colonel. Grab the ropes, my good men, and pull. Pull with all your hearts. Pull for your families. Pull for your freedom from tyranny. So now they get over the Berkshires. They're in Blanford. And again, this is the Knox Trail as laid out here. They're moving east towards Westfield now. Here's a marker here in the East Otis area in Massachusetts, MA5. That's the marker I showed you the photograph I had. So again, they're trying to get all the equipment safely down the mountainside without anybody getting injured or killed. And they're moving down a place called General Knox Road. And I tend to think that they took this route uh, because there was a loyalist enclave in the area and they didn't want to be seen. So they lumber into Westfield, and there's a massive celebration on January 14th, 1776. Remember that young boy, Becker, 12 years old? This is from his diary many years later. Our armament was a great curiosity in Westfield. We found that few, even the, among the oldest inhabitants, had ever seen a cannon. We were great gainers by this curiosity, for while they were employed in remarking upon our guns, we were, with equal pleasure, discussing the qualities of their cider and whiskey. So there's a big old party going on. And, and in that evening, Knox was surrounded by local visitors, burghers, all of whom seemed to be officers in the militia. And he says this sarcastically. What a pity that our soldiers are not as numerous as our officers. Too many chiefs. So now they are about to switch over. The Teamsters from New York can go back home. Mission well done. They're paid. They take their animals with them. The next portion will be done mostly by wagon and horses along better groomed roads and trails. And again, they're entering the camp here with the artillery. They did it. And they're moving towards Springfield, another river to cross, however, the Connecticut. It's January 16th. At Springfield, there was the broad Connecticut River to cross. The ice held, but on the far side, this noble train of artillery was bogged down now in the mud of a sudden thaw. Again, assumptions. He needed warm weather to get down uh, Lake George. He needed ice cold weather and snow to take the sleighs across the Hudson and Mohawk. And now they're about to cross the Connecticut and they get mud. So Knox pays off the drivers from New York state, state there and he hires native teamsters to follow the expedition all the way into Boston. New Yorkers go home, the Massachusetts teamsters take over and oaks and yo oxen yokes were now replaced with horse teams. And when the ground froze again, he pushed on. So again, that's maybe something that it would have looked like with these brave oxen. So just uh, looking at where the cannon train is, as opposed to Knox, December 5th, Ticonderoga, they reached the end of uh, Lake George on December 30th. Uh, Knox reached Albany by Christmas Day. The train didn't get there till the 4th of January. On the 9th of January, the train reached Claverack. They crossed the Berkshires, and they reach the train reaches uh, Springfield on January 16th. And by the 19th, the train reached Framingham. So here they are in Worcester, moving east. Then they get to Framingham. There were portions where they traveled along modern day Route 9, modern day Route 20, and you can tour it today. And it's January 19th, and Framingham is unloading. At Framingham, John Adams is there. Again, uh, Abigail never saw this This cannon train didn't go by the Adams house. So Knox temporarily deposited most of the heavier, heavier pieces in order to rush the more portable cannon to Washington and Cambridge. The heavier pieces will take more time while we can. Let's get these light pieces by wagon to uh, General Washington in Cambridge stat. And Washington at this point now in January, he's considering an over ice attack on Boston. It is said that every morning he'd jump up and down on the Boston Harbor ice to see how thick it was to see if you could attack from Dorchester. And now they get into Weston, Mass again, just off Route 20. And they move through in this area into Waltham, into Watertown. 
I used to live right along that route at one point. And this is in Watertown in front of the library. This through this place passed General Henry Knox in the winter of 1776 to deliver to General George Washington at Cambridge, the train of artillery from Fort Ticonderoga used to force the British army to evacuate Boston. So January 24th, we know that just down the road is fine weather and a bit of snow in Dedham. Henry Knox sub submits a simple memorandum of expenses. Quote, for expenditures in a journey from the camp around Boston to New York, Albany and Ticonderoga, and from thence with 55 pieces of iron and brass ordnance, one barrel of flints and 23 boxes of lead back to camp, including expenses of myself, brother and a servant, 520 pounds. Now he came in under budget because his budget was 1200 pounds. He came in 50% less. Great project management. And here you can see they're moving into the em encampment at Cambridge where most of the Continental Army is residing at this time in General Washington. Washington is using uh, Henry Longfellow's house, which would later become Henry Longfellow's house as his command headquarters. And still the British don't know what's happening. So the question is, where did they stash the cannons until March? At a place called Fort Washington. The end game here is to place them atop Dorchester Heights. And this is where Fort La uh, Washington is located today, just across Charles River. And this is what it looks like today. You can actually see um, where they actually had dugouts and ramparts and bulwarks. Now they moved to Roxbury. They want to go to Dorchester Heights. So we know that the artillery placement, and I'm going to be reading an article in just a moment. In early March, wagon loads of birch brush were dragged in wagons and carts to the heights to use as embrasures, bulwarks, and bastions. They'll, they're building this quick uh, fortress up on Dorchester Heights. And also, they were collected by residents of Dorchester and Boston. They went out collecting uh, tree branches, uh, trunks of trees leading up to that gun emplacement. Everybody did their part. And they used this thing known as star to muffle the sound of the cannon carts and trolleys. In other words, the squeaky wheels of the trolleys, that could be heard um, by some loyalists or even maybe across, across the harbor by the British. We know that many people dragged brush, and most of them didn't even speak above a whisper again, the cannon train. So Washington began moving men into Dorchester Heights in preparation for cannon installations from March 2nd through the 5th. And by March 2nd, 1776, they began firing at British positions and first as a feint or a diversion from the column of men as a distraction to the British uh, as they were moving all this equipment through the streets of Dorchester and Roxbury. So this was primarily used as a distraction. Finally, Knox's artillery was maneuvered into position on Dorchester Heights on the night of March 4th. 2,000 men and women assisted in the disassembling and reassembling of the artillery pieces. And on March 5th, firing upon British ships and positions commenced from the batteries at Dorchester Heights. Now, after seeing the rebel batteries in place on Dorchester Heights, General Howe from the British made half-hearted plans for taking the heights on the night of March 6th. But a tremendous wind and rainstorm came up from the west that he called a hurricane which caused him to abort his attack. He thought he'd lose his men, and actually they were seasick as they were loaded on longboats over the night. So he decided on March 9th that he would be evacuating the city in eight days on March 17th with his 7,000 men in tow. And Howe threatened to burn Boston to the ground if his embarkation was molested by Knox's artillery, and subsequently he took his depar departure practically undisturbed. There was a ceasefire. He sent an envoy to convey his plans to General Washington. Let us leave, don't fire on us, and there'll be no trouble. If you do, we'll burn Boston to the ground. So on March 9th to the 10th, 1776, the forgotten Battle of Dorchester Heights takes place. According to Nathaniel Ames in Boyle's Journal of Occurrences, on March 10th, four men were killed at Dorchester by cannonball, fired by the British from their ships. The night before, at 9 p.m. on Saturday the 9th, several forts in Roxbury began to bombard the town of Boston, again, British occupied. One Dr. Dole and three privates, having imprudently kindled a fire on Nooks Hill as they were setting by it, were all killed by a cannonball from the enemy's lines who kept up a severe cannonade most part of the night. So that's the view of Boston from Dorchester Heights. And at 1 o'clock on March 17, 1776, General Washington sent 1,500 troops into Boston. Boston at that point was suffering from an outbreak of smallpox, and these men had either been inoculated or they somehow had an immunity to smallpox, and that's why Washington chose them to go into Boston. So George Washington paraded triumphantly into Boston. He was greeted by all the people 
Uh, he had freed them. He was a liberator. You can see Washington look at the ships. Bye bye. So again, Knox says 55 guns in his diary. Sometimes he mentions 59, which means that some went missing, but they went 300 miles in 56 days or about five and a half miles per day. One gun tube that was lost through the ice in crossing the Mohawk River was not recovered for a century. In fact, there was a feud between competing families that saw the cannon thrown back into the river in 1909, only to be excavated again in 1996. And the second cannon made it to Boston. It was displayed at the Bunker Hill Monument, broken up for scrap during World War II. Then it was recovered, restored, and returned back to Fort Ticonderoga. No men were lost in this expedition, and less than six beasts of burden were lost. Only one major snowstorm was encountered, and that was around Christmas time in Albany. And this expedition would have failed in the winter of 1775, which was quite warmer, and it would have gone smoother had they done this uh, in the winter of 77, where it was ice cold. So three questions to ask. Why wasn't the expedition given away to the British? Was it a perfect clandestine operation? Was there poor intelligence on behalf of the British, or did they ignore intelligence? And I say yes to all four of those questions. Uh, why I wasn't given away? Probably some intelligence got back to the uh, Britain High Command, the British High Command in Boston, and they ignored it. Thanks for joining me on Journey Through the Past, the Knox Expedition, Evacuation Day. I'm John Horrigan. Thanks for watching. Journey Through the Past is brought to you by the Wellesley Council on Aging. Thanks so much for watching.